welcome everybody. This is a joint lecture, joint meeting, partnership health, many for change. I see folks from everywhere here. This is great. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Anita Berman, right over there. Many of you know Anita, and she is our star dietitian nutritionist in the Many for Change program. And she also serves to provide other nutritional um, consults as well. Her little bio here, so she got her Bachelor of Arts from Oberlin College. Is that in Ohio? Okay, got that right. In 2008. And then her Master's of Science in Nutrition at Bastyr in 2014. And her dietetic internship she did in Bastyr in 2015. She's worked at Harrison Memorial, it's a Berlin Peninsula, doing inpatient and outpatient nutrition consults. A lot of them general nutrition and also related to oncology. So really interesting stuff. She joined us late last year. If it's the end of the year flurry and then that office moves, so it's been quite exciting. But um, she's going to talk about something that may be a little different than you think. This is a kind of a buzzword in, in uh, the lay press, but the compassionate cleanse. So here is Anita. I wanted to tackle a really popular topic this time of year of the cleanse with a little bit of a different lens. Um, so we'll see how that goes tonight, and I've left some time for questions at the end. Um, so that we can really get into some of your questions as well. So it is spring, and it's awesome that it's actually sunny outside today because it goes with this idea that spring is coming. Uh, if it had snowed, I think it wouldn't have felt quite right for the time for this talk. Uh, but it's spring, and so for many of us, that is a time to think about the fluffy bunnies and the Easter eggs and the flowers that are blooming, the tulips, the baby animals, all of that beautiful color in nature, the tweeting birds. It's a time to reflect on new birth and nature. And also, as Bernard Jensen says, <laughs> the fact that the colon is a Pandora's box out of which has come more human misery and suffering, mental and moral, as from any known source. <laughs> So what, that's a little odd, this, this picture is from a detox company's website, uh, they sell a supplement, Detox 6, and the idea with this picture is after the winter excesses, your colon is filled with this sludge, this really gross, dark, horrible sludge that needs to be cleaned out, perhaps using their supplement, so that you can be fresh just like a new closet or a clean windowsill to start the spring anew, right? So this idea is very prevalent in, in our culture right now at the springtime. Uh, you see it on all kinds of different magazines. Gwyneth Paltrow and her Goop website always has some new spring diet uh, to, to sell. Um, and it's really pervasive in our culture. All the stars are doing it. I love these women's world covers because there's the Get Slim Detox Tea that will whisk away obesinogens at the same time a recipe for cutie cake pops for Easter fun. Um, and I, I would imagine that Dr. Stork's Spring Detox doesn't include Oreo fun, although I don't know. Um, but it certainly makes for good news and a lot of drama to, to play that up on these covers. But the question is, is this cleansing really necessary for us, and what is it really doing for us to, to follow these different detox regimens? There are a lot of claims that cleanses make. Um, you may have seen these kind of claims that you might get improved skin texture and better libido, and you're going to lose a pound a day and completely clean out, you know, scrub your liver like a dirty sink needs to be scrubbed out. And not only that, but you're going to rid the body, mind, and spirit of debris and toxins, and that was actually from a, a cleanse package. And the spirit, too, I'm not quite sure how celery juice does clean the spirit. Perhaps it does somehow. <laughs> um, but there's this idea that not only are we getting this physical benefit from some kind of determined diet cleanse regimen in the spring, but also some sort of mental or spiritual benefit uh, here's another one. The Herbalist is a supplement company in Seattle, and they sell a detox. And it says on their package that we have our mental focus compromised by the constant juggling of modern day distractions, these cell phones, internet, and traffic. And then boom, cleansing removes toxins and pollutants from the inside. So again, how this product is going to cleanse us of the traffic and the email and the cell phone, <laughs> I'm really not sure. I would love to 
know what will clean out my email inbox that I can drink. Um, but we're, we're hoping for something greater, something more than just bodily cleansing. Um, this is another quote I'll let you read from that. Bernard Jensen, he was the, the chiropractor who invented uh, the colon flushing. So where you have water, um, you know, a hose basically inserted up the back and you get a colonic and you get flushed out. So his idea was that if we don't actively flush out our colon, then it's going to become a cesspool. That we're going to have every organ of the body poisoned. Um, we're going to be com completely putrefying such that the pleasure of living is gone. Um, so some pretty dramatic stuff. And a bit confusing from a medical perspective because if you've ever talked to a doctor or you've learned much about how your colon works, there actually is this mucosal barrier in the colon that is really good at keeping the stool and the toxins from the stool from leaking out into our bloodstream. And in fact, when it stops working, um, that's a medical emergency. That's sepsis, that's an infection that could take over the whole body in a very immediate and urgent way. So this idea that we're kind of just slowly leaking little bits of toxins out from our colon into the rest of our body, um, if we don't clean that out, isn't really founded on, on much science. Um, but this idea um, that things are, are very, very bad if we don't take action, and by taking action with the magic pill, things can get very, very good, um, is an example of magical thinking or magical medicine. And if any of you were alive at the turn of the century, um, you know, as I was obviously, um, in 1916, you might have seen a lot of ads like this for holy waters that had been blessed that would you know, clean out every disease from your body. Um, this is a radioactive waistband that can cure you of high blood pressure, constipation, nervous prostration, uh, <laughs> asthma, heart, liver, kidney, etc. I love the etc. because it just suggests that whatever we haven't listed here, obviously it's going to cleanse you of that too. Um, so this, we're very susceptible to this idea of magical medicine, that there is something out there that, that, that is that perfect pill that is going to bring us health. And why does that happen? Why are we so susceptible to that? Um, oftentimes there is a kernel of truth in some of these claims buried underneath. Perhaps there is a benefit to drinking green juices and um, having certain supplements in one's diet, uh, but can those things cure us of emails and cure us of our spiritual dis-ease and cure us of every disease imaginable. Um, so this, this desire for perfectionism causes us to reach for these magical answers. And I would, I would love to believe in magic, uh, but I, I don't really, and probably most of you don't really either. But somehow we get sucked in time and again to these claims that this, this pill, this diet, this drug will solve everything for us. And what I've seen is that when we get sucked into this black and white thinking where everything we're doing is wrong and we must have this one perfect solution or else, we kind of miss that middle road, that gray area where happiness actually can live and satisfaction can actually live. Um, I really love this quote, the perfect is the enemy of the good, because it really speaks to that idea that sometimes good is what is attainable, and perfection by definition really is something that we're always striving for and never quite reach. And so if we think that we're going to solve every problem that our body has forever and perfectly, um, and be young again, and be, you know, so be 16 again, and, and everything kind of the clock reversed, um, then we're unable to have that satisfaction in the moment that might be attainable to us. So um, I love this ad. Get rid of your Diwali, that's an Indian a holiday. Wait, by this magical detox diet? Because they're not even trying to cloak it. They, they understand that we want magic. They're giving us magic. And look at the beautiful color. It must be magic. So we're going to buy into that. Um, and so these claims are everywhere, and the question is, how do we navigate that and find those kernels of truth while still living in the gray area? So today I want to talk about taking care of ourselves in the spring season. Um, as throughout the rest of the year, detoxification is something that your body does. 
every day, all year round. And we're going to talk about how that happens and how you can support that every day. But we're also going to look a little bit more at the history of where some of these detox and cleansing practices might have come from, um, just to reflect a little bit on how that affects the way that we see our bodies and the way that we see food. So many of you uh, probably have heard of this idea that, that toxins build up in the body and if we cleanse them out, we're going to be healthier. It underlies the idea of detoxification, whether it's just the colon or whether it's the entire body. Um, and in alternative medicine, a lot of treatments are aimed around treating those toxins and removing those toxins from the body. And it, it makes sense on one level because our society does have more toxic substances than in the past. I mean, we have more chemical companies making more chemicals and there's more pollution in our air and our water and in our environment. So it makes sense that we would be thinking about this a little bit more. But the question is, do we need to focus intentionally on that or are our bodies able to handle um, the, that increased pollution in our environment? And also, is there anything we can do on an individual basis, or is environmental pollution more of a societal problem and individual detox something to just kind of leave to the body? Um, so that is a question. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that this idea of detoxifying or cleansing out the body didn't start with the age of industry, didn't start with chemicals. That idea is actually very, very old. So fasting, for religious reasons, it can be akin to detox, and I think predates it, um, but can be a little bit different as well. Um, this is a quote from Taoism, um, from a Taoist text, and it says, those who eat meat are brave but cruel. Those who eat qi have bright spirits and long lives. Those who eat grains are intelligent but die early. Those who do not eat at all are immortal. So this is centuries old wisdom from the religion of Taoism telling us that if we don't eat, we will be immortal. Raise your hand if you believe that that's actually <laughs> true. So this wasn't meant necessarily to be uh, interpreted as actual dietary advice. Um, Perhaps it was meant as spiritual inspiration at a time in which uh, historically at this time there were some food shortages and there were some fasts that were necessitated by cultural upheaval and there was some starvation and so perhaps this was providing some spiritual inspiration. Um, but this idea that by not eating somehow by this religious aestheticism or punishment, we could become closer to the spiritual world is a very, very old idea. Um, and if, you, if you're not familiar with what chi is, it's a sort of energy, it's not a cracker or soup or something. So um, this, this is saying, if we don't eat anything at all, we'll be better off, which we know is, is not really uh, physically true. In some cultures, fasting has historically happened as a result of other uh, influences, other natural influences. Uh, I recently took a trip to the Sonoran Desert area of the U.S. and the Seguro cactus fruit is a major food source in that region. And it, uh, the cactus fruits in June. And so May is the last month in which there is no um, no stored food really available, it's before the fruit is ripening, and so May is that month in which there's the least food supply available historically, and so it was called the hunger moon, and it was, a time, it was understood as a time of hunger, um, and this was because of the necessity of, of food just not being as available and trying to make it through that time as a people together. And out of some of these necessities, religious inspiration for fasting has arisen. I think, though, that in our uh, Western culture, the idea of detoxification, the idea of the body as dirty and in need of cleansing, um, really originates for us in Christian ideology or, um, or uh, readings. Um, 
so this is uh, some quotes from the Bible that all speak to the idea that if we can clean ourselves out somehow of sin, then we will reach some higher spiritual plane. Harkening back to that religious asceticism that we've seen in Taoism, uh, we've seen in the Islamic faith during Ramadan, a time of fasting, and these religious fasts and religious cleanses can often bring people closer to their spiritual <laughs> beliefs. Um, but we've taken them, I think, in this culture to a place where uh, it's become really linked to our nutritional beliefs as well. And uh, so some of these quotes, purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean, wash me, I shall be whiter than snow, um, really originated from this idea that sin would build up in the body and it would need to be cleaned out. And I think that in Western cultures, um, this aestheticism is something that's really been internalized for many of us in our relationship, not just to the spiritual realm, but also to food. Um, I, I hear many people speaking of their dietary choices as a sin or as a bad uh, choice in the same way that we might speak of ourselves as a sinner, perhaps, in, in the Catholic faith. Um, eating a donut, eating meat, um, is very pleasurable to many people, and it's linked to that idea that um, if we if we have pleasure, perhaps we're a bad person, and if we refrain from pleasure, perhaps it makes us a better person, um, or a cleaner, or a holier person. Um, and so we don't always realize how much our idea of wanting to be clean or cleansed out can be linked back to some of that religious imagery and religious writings, um, both in Christianity and in other religions throughout the world. Um, so I bring that up just as a way to kind of put things into perspective and remember that when we're wanting to cleanse out the body, it's important to ask ourselves, what is it that we're wanting to cleanse out? Is it just um, that we have stool that's built up in our digestive system and we're wanting to move that through? Or is it that we have a need to cleanse something spiritual and something that's bigger than just the more mental and emotional um, than just food. And if that is the case, then how can we actually address that uh, directly rather than through the realm of food? So there's a, a lot of different kinds of cleanses out there. Um, some of them are, to, are fasts where you're not eating at all. Some of them are restricted to just juices or just raw vegetables. Um, who here has actually been on a cleanse or a detox that's an intentional cleanse or detox? I've, I've done it myself, no shame. Um, any, call out any kinds of restrictions that you've followed or heard of following on, on a cleanse that you've either done or had someone else you know do? No sugar. No sugar, yeah. That avoidance of non-organic. Avoidance of non-organic, yeah. <laughs> Lemon, maple syrup, cayenne pepper. Yes, the master <laughs> cleanse. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, that one's been around for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so some are extremely restrictive, and some are, um, you know, just a couple of things. It's like non-organic foods. Anything else really weird that people have heard of as a detox regimen? Chelation stuff? Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. So chelation, if you're not familiar with it, as a way to remove heavy metals from the body. Um, and so, for example, like activated charcoal is a supplement that you can take that's supposed to bind to heavy metals and flush them out of the body. Um, it causes some blackness of the, the food as it goes out of your body. Uh, anything else really weird? I heard of one involving hydrogen peroxide, like really diluted hydrogen peroxide. That I've heard of too in and recent I, I, I don't know what I mean. years. I think it has to do with this idea that you can change the acid-base balance of the body and somehow clean out the body that way. Yeah. Has anyone ever had bad symptoms on a cleanse or just felt kind of icky or awful? A lot of times cleanses will say you're going to feel terrible at the beginning, but that's the poison or the toxins leaving your body. And once that happens, you're gonna feel great. Um, which for some people, that stage never really ends. Uh, especially on a lemon cayenne maple syrup <laughs> cleanse, which is a starvation diet. 
Um, so it, it will allow you to reach that immortal spiritual plane, I'm sure, but <laughs> the physical plane, I'm not so sure. So there's a lot of them out there, right? This is one that when I was in nutrition school and we learned about detox, we were recommended. And this is supposed to be a healthier version of a detox, but you'll see there's still a lot of good and bad, yes and no, around food in here. So sure, maybe it's fine to have lots of fresh garlic and lemons every day. I would agree that all those are wonderful vegetables to include in the diet. Um, but this is also asking you to avoid meat, milk, potatoes, processed food, refined grains, um, those foods that make you cruel and intelligent but die early, um, <laughs> and to have purified water, so it has to be pure, pure, wholly clean and not just any old water, um, <clears throat> and then only organic foods. So there's some, some real restrictions still inherent within that. Um, and so one question one would have is, well, so what? I can restrict things in my diet for a couple weeks in order to scrub out my liver or scrub out my colon so it looks really nice and shiny clean. Why not do that? One of the reasons is because it doesn't work. And all the research that has been done on detox diets shows that there's very little evidence to support the idea that going on one of these diets increases your body's detoxification any more than what it's already doing if you eat some of these foods and have a balanced diet. Um, there are certain foods that have been associated with higher levels of detoxification enzymes ramping up in the body, but that doesn't mean that it's necessary to only eat those foods in order to experience that benefit. And that comes down to that black and white thinking where we see, okay, there's a study that says um, that coriander is really seeming to help my liver work a little bit better. Therefore, the coriander diet, eat only coriander all the time. I'm sure that's around the corner. Um, and that's somehow going to clean us out better than if we just ate our normal diet and tried to sprinkle in coriander. because. If we just eat a coriander diet, uh, we're going to feel really different. Things are going to change dramatically for us, as opposed to if we sprinkle some coriander on our rice, we're not really going to notice that anything is happening. So there's nothing to really pat ourselves on the back and say, I've made a major change. Um, I am born again as a new person. Um, and so the, research, the lack of research, the lack of evidence is one concern. But you might say, so what? It doesn't matter if it doesn't work. You know, it makes me feel better. It makes me feel good about myself to do the coriander diet for 10 days. So why not do that? And I would say that there's a few issues with that as well. I'm going to drink some water. So, yes, there's a lack of evidence. There's also some people that have experienced dangerous side effects as a result. There are people, because many cleanses and fasts are in fact starvation, who have died on them, which isn't a surprise because it is starvation, and food is necessary for life at some level. Um, everyone's ability to tolerate a fast is different, um, and as we get older and sicker, that ability to tolerate a longer fast does go down. Um, but those really dangerous side effects, I would say, are not common. Um, some people can get mineral imbalances temporarily when they're, eating, they're drinking lots and lots of water and they're flushing out the minerals from their body. Um, but again, not necessarily the most common at some of these detox resort type places with more extreme regimens It can be more common to have their, their clients turn into patients in the hospital. Um, but for most of us, we don't really notice too much of those symptoms, especially if the cleanses are short term. Um, but what we might notice is that we're increasing this idea that food that is not on the cleanse is poison. Because whenever we take a break away from certain foods and try to avoid them, 
every single day that we're avoiding those foods, we're having to again tell our brain, bad, no, no, bad, no, 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 and send that, send that message again to our brain over and over again that there's something wrong with that. It's somehow contaminated, and therefore that's the justification for why we want to continue to avoid it. And if we just do that for a moment, perhaps we can recover. If we do that for a lifetime or for a long period of time of just no, 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 bad, 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 that's not allowed, then that sets us up for this dichotomy where if we do eat those foods, we feel really bad about ourselves and we have trouble recovering from that, uh, from that experience, um, which is what I call, um, actually I don't call, um, it has been called the diet binge cycle. Um, so this is a graphic, if you've been my patient, you may have seen. Um, it's from a book called The Diet Survivor's Handbook. And I really love it because it speaks to this idea that when we put restrictions on our diet, eventually we're going to feel deprived. Because it's human nature to want the things we've been told we can't have, even if we come up with a million reasons for why we shouldn't have them. It's just human nature to want that. And so eventually, if we feel deprived for long enough, that leads to overeating of, of either those foods or other foods that are going to bring us that sense of pleasure or in that deprivation cycle. Um, and with cleanses, for some people, it's pretty short and there's not a huge amount of deprivation at the end of it. Um, but certainly many people who've been on the experience of a longer diet um, do relate the experience of, you know what, I broke my diet, um, or it's the night before my diet, I'm going to eat whatever I want. And so that's that binge or, or overeating aspect that comes from deprivation. And there have been studies on people who are um, the most normal in their relationship to food. So they're what's called unrestrained eaters. And so an unrestrained eater is someone that allows themselves whatever types of foods they want and doesn't um, send their brain messages of I was bad or this is bad after eating certain foods. And those unrestrained eaters always seem to have, weirdly enough, lower body weights than the eaters that are restrained eaters. And these are the people who have a long list of rules around the foods that should and should not be included in their diet. And we think that part of that is because the restraint leads to this overeating and leads to this, this cycle um, where shame and negative thoughts kind of fuel further and further restrictions. Oftentimes we overeat and then we feel like we need to go on another cleanse and the cycle just repeats itself. So this I think is probably one of the biggest dangers that I see um, in going on a cleanse is that it can trigger this sort of a mindset. There's something else called the nocebo effect. Has anyone heard of the placebo effect? Um, so the nocebo effect is the opposite of the placebo effect. So substances that we believe will harm us actually cause us harm even if we're not ingesting those substances. And this has been studied time and again and it's just as strong as the placebo effect. Um, it's the power of what's called contagious rumor, that ideas about disease or food can actually spread and cause disease. Um, a really good example of this that's been studied is something called wind turbine syndrome. And they did a study, um, so for whatever reason, people who in Western countries, especially in America, who live near wind turbines report that they're suffering from headaches, dizziness, sort of general malaise, um, because of those wind turbines, they think, are emitting something called infrasound, which is a sub-audible sound that is somehow damaging their nervous system. And so people report these symptoms. But for some reason, people in non-English speaking countries who don't live near wind turbines don't seem to have those same symptoms. So they've done studies, and there was one study in Australia where they took a group of people and they told them they were exposing them to infrasound, um, but they didn't actually. They exposed them to nothing. And another group of people that they told they were exposing to infrasound, and they did expose them to something that was supposed to be infrasound. Um, and then two more groups of people, one that was told they were not being exposed to infrasound, but yet was, 
and another that was told they were not and was not. And as you might expect, both groups that were told they were being exposed to infrasound, whether or not they actually were, experienced wind turbine syndrome. Neither of the groups that was told that they were not experiencing um, that infrasound experienced the syndrome. So it was the belief that they were being harmed rather than the actual presence of infrasound that <coughs> caused those symptoms. And this can really play out in the food world. I love this book, The Gluten Lie. Um, I think it was a book club book a while back because it talks about how some of these um, myths that get spread can be damaging for us. Um, one of these is the gluten sensitivity idea. Celiac disease is real and some people do suffer from it. And non-celiac gluten sensitivity seems to affect a very small percentage of people who perhaps have a family tendency towards celiac but haven't quite developed it yet. Um, but a very, very large number of people in recent years, since the publication of books like Wheat Belly, are reporting that they experience all kinds of symptoms with gluten ingestion, um, stomach upset, bloating, gas, aches and pains, because we've been told that gluten will cause these things. However, time and time again in studies, when they tell people they're not exposing them to gluten, but yet do, they don't experience these symptoms if they are not a celiac and don't actually have a real sensitivity. Um, and time and again, um, the opposite happens where there's no exposure to gluten, but you're told you are being exposed and yet you develop the symptoms. Um, this can happen with nut allergies, it can happen in, with nausea when walking into a chemotherapy room. Um, one that I find really interesting is that um, it can actually happen with anaphylactic allergies, and so people who are maybe allergic to nuts, they've done studies where they inject a saline solution into, the pe into these people and tell them they're injecting peanuts and people actually develop an allergic reaction. So they actually start to develop hives and their throat actually starts to close up because for whatever reason, our brain is powerful enough that when we're told we're under attack, this whole trigger of inflammation happens. Um, and so the power of believing that something is going to harm us is very, very strong and it's a dangerous weapon to wield. And that's one of the problems with a cleanse when we start to believe that sugar, that gluten, that grains actually harm our body, then we start to feel symptoms from those foods that maybe we wouldn't if we hadn't been told that those foods harm our body. Um, and so teasing that out can get really complicated. So I want to talk about the ways in which the human body naturally works to detoxify itself on a daily basis, because I think it's important to just take comfort in the fact that a healthy body does work to clean you out of toxins every single day of your life without actually needing to take a lot of time and attention. Um, this picture is of the digestive system um, and so, so a few other systems. It's a little hard to see. Um, but we have what's called these organs of elimination already built into our body system. And their job is to take excuse me, to take any toxins and clean it out of our body naturally as we go about our lives. Toxins are not just pollutants, not just things that come in from the outside, but our body actually as the process of normal metabolism, processing all food, breathing, makes its own toxins that we then have to clean out. And so it's natural, it's a natural chemical process that when we when we perform a chemical reaction in the body, there's gonna be some some waste that needs to be cleaned out. And so for that reason, your body's really good at doing this. So one of the organs of elimination that we don't think about all the time is the skin. Um, and through water, through sweat, our skin actually helps to flush out. Um, different things that we want to get rid of right out through our skin. Our lungs, as we breathe, we breathe out carbon dioxide and cleanse out our lungs from having that build up. Our digestive system is a really key piece of cleansing us out. 
um, we poop, you know, hopefully every single day or most every single day. And that takes all that waste matter that we don't need right out of our body. Um, bile is a substance that flows out of the liver and through the gallbladder and it dissolves all of these residue of hormones and different residue of digesting food that our body doesn't want anymore and need anymore and it helps to kind of flush that out into the stool and get it out of the body. We urinate every day and our urine flushes things out of our body um, and then at the, the core, the master organ of all of this is the liver that actually does the chemistry of detoxifying the body. So just taking a little bit of a, lo a look at the liver, um, it's a pretty massive organ and it does a lot of work for us. It actually every minute pumps seven and a half cups of blood through it. And as it's doing that, it's kind of like a filter, a, a tea strainer. Um, it's basically, through a lot of different processes, filtering all kinds of stuff out of our blood um, to detoxify us. So it's taking bacteria and viruses and filtering them out. When we eat, um, all of the food that we eat has to be in some way processed by the liver so that it can get filtered out. Um, it helps to balance our blood sugar. It helps to break down hormones and flush them out of our body. So the liver is doing a lot of the chemistry behind detoxification in the body. Um, the thing about the liver when it detoxes though is that it takes nutrition for it to do that. It takes protein, it takes energy, it takes different vitamins and minerals, and a fast doesn't actually work when, when you're not eating at all um, or you're only drinking water. Your liver actually slows down how much it's detoxing because it just doesn't have the nutrition to do that process. Um, so it's really energy intensive, nutrient intensive, um, and that's why people who have a lot of micronutrients and good food in their diet do actually detox a little bit better than someone who's, who's not eating much at all. There's two phases of liver detox and um, I won't get into the detailed chemistry of it, but in the first phase, basically your body, most toxic compounds that build up are fat soluble. And in order for our body to flush those out, it has to make them water soluble. And so the first phase of detox is basically preparing to make them water soluble. And the second phase is actually making them water soluble so that we can sweat them out, so that we can pee them out, so that we can flush them into our bowel and get them out of our body that way. Um, but it's a process of taking things that are at its core, taking things that are not water soluble and making them that way. Every drug that you take has to go through this process to get out of your body every food that you eat. Um, if anyone here is on warfarin or similar medications where you've been told not to eat grapefruit, the reason for that is because during the first phase of liver detox, there's an enzyme, it's called cytochrome P450, um, there's an enzyme that your body uses to flush that drug out of your body. So to flush the warfarin out of your body, it needs this enzyme. It uses the exact same enzyme to flush grapefruit out of the body. And so if you're eating a lot of grapefruit and you're taking your drug, it's possible that that could compete for that enzyme. And then maybe you wouldn't be able to flush all that drug out of your body as well. Thinking about it that way also reminds us though that if we happen to accidentally eat a piece of grapefruit while we're on warfarin, we're not going to die. It's just that at that moment perhaps the enzyme would be a little bit occupied, but it's more about the overall diet and not having grapefruit every day with every meal so that that's building up and preventing the drug from, from detoxing. So when there's a food drug interaction, it often comes down to liver detox and how we're clearing it out of our body. I, uh, I just want to call out traditional Chinese medicine for a minute uh, because we do have that element in the Menu for Change program. In traditional Chinese medicine, the liver is thought of as the organ of spring. And um, for whatever reason, in the springtime, 
um, it's recommended that people think about foods that will support the liver. And in traditional Chinese medicine, um, these are some of the foods that are, are said to support the liver. Um, you'll notice they're all plants, um, pretty bitter tasting or sour or pungent tasting plants. Um, some of these may have some science behind them in terms of maybe they seem to enhance detox a little bit. Um, some of them don't. Um, but that idea, I think, that the spring is a time in which liver comes to the fore is interesting, uh, interesting to think about. Um, even at all the times of the year, even when it's not spring though, um, I think it's important to think about how can we just keep all of our organs of elimination working the best that they can. And it's, it's not as sexy to try to do something every day for the rest of your life as it is for, you know, just the next week. Um, but it's actually, if your goal is actually to detox, to get the liver running smoothly, it's actually going to work a lot better. Um, so the skin, it's all about the sweat. It's all about getting fluid to come out through sweat in the skin. So if it's physical activity that helps you to sweat, um, if it's a steam room or sauna that helps you to sweat, um, then that's going to be helpful for getting that skin to eliminate. Um, I think it's interesting in in certain cultures where winter happens for a long time, like in, in Norse cultures, that sauna is so prevalent. Uh, and I think it's not just that it, it helps with warmth, but it helps bring sweat to the fore in a time in which maybe it's not as possible to go out and run around and work in the fields and use your body as much. And so perhaps you can still keep your body fl flowing smoothly um, by sitting in a sauna, and it might feel really good too. And then if we're going to be sweating, we also want that fluid so that we have the water in our body. Um, and this is how uh, dietitians calculate fluids, 35 milliliters per kilogram, um, or if you're over 65, 30, um, in terms of daily needs. Um, the, the, the 35, if you weigh 200 pounds, ends up being um, around 100 ounces, and some of you may heard drink half your body weight in ounces, so that also evens out. Um, but for most people, it just means focusing on a little bit more fluid so that we're flushing ourselves out uh, regularly. Fluid also helps our lungs. Um, we need fluid to be able to have our lungs um, exchange and work really well with that air, um, but also breathing deeply and using our full lung capacity. <sighs> Because when we're only breathing in the top part of our lungs, there's a lot more lung there that could be working to clean out the air that we're breathing that we're not using. And when we get stressed and we breathe really high up in our chest, it's hard to access that full range of the lung motion. And so for each person thinking about what can allow us to feel calm enough on a day-to-day -day basis that we're using our full lungs and taking advantage of all of that air cleaning power that our lungs have um, on a day-to-day -day basis. The digestive system is probably the biggest area that, that I personally work with um, for people and there's a lot that you can do. Um, it's about your bowel movements but it's also about what happens before the bowel movements and um, <coughs> When you're, when you're thinking about the bowel movement specifically, um, stress management comes into play more than I think many people realize. Um, there's, there's, there's almost a, an increased, I, I seem to see an increased prevalence um, nowadays in people who have IBS with constipation where we're kind of holding back and having a hard time having a bowel movement, um, which comes from comes from stress, comes from basically some neurologic upset, because we have this nerve that runs straight between our brain and our digestive system. And so if we have a thought about, you know, ah, this, this presentation is due and I'm so stressed, that goes straight to our digestion. And when we're trying to eat under stress, when we're trying to poop under stress, um, it's really hard to do well. And so we might be prone to not have things move through us as quickly uh, as we would if we were in a little bit of a calmer state. So I think that's really important. Um, fiber and fluids, though, are also important to think about when moving bowel movements through us. And with fiber, 
including both soluble and insoluble fiber. And what are those? Uh, insoluble fiber is probably what we think of the most when we think of fiber, which is the kind of the roughage, the stringy bits of food. But soluble fiber, um, which is what's in oatmeal, is, is more gooey and soft and it helps to just kind of smooth things through us. Um, and when we eat uh, not just oatmeal but other whole grains and beans, um, those are really good sources of soluble fiber as are fruits. Um, so whereas the vegetables give us a lot of that roughage, um, we also get that, that important benefit from having the, the beans and the grains. Um, so those are all kind of foundational things, but there's a couple more things. Um, intuitive eating, if you have been exposed to that, um, it's the way that I teach eating in, uh, with many of my patients, is this idea that um, we're, go we're going to start eating when we're hungry, whenever we're hungry, and we're going to stop when we're full. And when we stop when we're full, um, we're going to be probably a lot more comfortable, um, but also using the amount of digestive enzymes that we have available for that meal. Um, and sometimes when we eat under stress and we eat more than we really wanted to, we're not able to break down all of our food fully and eliminate it fully because maybe we didn't have all of the um, enzymes produced by our body for that meal. Something that um, can help is that bitter flavor, that flavor that in Chinese medicine is associated with spring. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and if you are a person who feels like things are just moving kind of slowly through you, uh, fruits are a natural source of enzymes. And when we include fruits as part of our diet, that can give us a, just a little bit more of a boost that way. Um, and then sometimes the foods that are fermented or pickled can help people with that as well because um, supporting a healthy, healthy microbiome. So there's a lot there with digestion. Um, the thing I want to call out though is the bitter because that's what, what is more present in springtime. Um, we drink coffee, we eat chocolate quite often in our day-to-day -day life, but we're not always exposed to as much other bitter foods as perhaps um, our body would like. Um, and vegetables are typically bitter tasting, but in the spring, there are even more, the vegetables are typically at their most bitter um, because those leaves, those first shoots, um, things like arugula and dandelion greens um, and kale as it's growing in the spring, all of those are bitter green vegetables that are naturally available in the springtime. And what that bitter flavor does for us is it increases uh, that bile flow from our liver through our gallbladder that helps to sort of break down and smooth things through our body. Um, and so that's something that can be helpful. That bitter taste on the tongue also seems to stimulate more uh, stomach acid, more hydrochloric acid being produced, which can help us break down our food better. Um, and also enzymes. Every food that we eat, every medicine that we break down has to be broken down with an enzyme. And that bitter flavor helps us to kind of produce a little bit more enzymes. It's a signal that a meal is happening. And I think it, it harkens back to this idea that many people have eaten salads at the beginning of the meal to kind of give that bitter flavor. Um, and so it's a, it's a mild effect, but I think a helpful effect when we're trying to just have digestion work better overall. And usually um, something like these digestive bitters supplement isn't necessary for people. Usually just thinking a little bit more about the bitter flavors in food can be helpful. Um, but for people who are having a large meal that they just feel like is really uncomfortable in their body, sometimes bitters can help that feel a little bit better. Um, so on that day-to-day -day basis for the liver then, thinking about those bitter foods, um, but also thinking about um, are we minimizing our medications to the point that we're able to. So there are certain medications many of us need, but extra medications might just be taking a little bit of extra work. Um, extra alcohol might take a little bit of extra work. I think it's important though to listen to our body signals around alcohol because often over the winter holidays we drink more if we are people who drink alcohol and feel like I need to stop, I need to completely cut out alcohol now. Um, when in fact your body does tell you there are signals of 
um, of pain and discomfort as your liver becomes um, stressed trying to process a lot of alcohol. And if we, if we tune into that and we notice, oh, I'm a little bit uncomfortable, um, and make that decision just for the moment, just for this meal, about whether our body wants to have more alcohol, it's a lot um, usually more helpful for people than saying, you know, now that it's spring, no alcohol all spring. Um, unless there's, you know, perhaps you're, you have a history of alcoholism and you're just trying to avoid it completely. But if that's not the case, then just kind of listening to the body and saying, you know what, for this meal, maybe I'll skip it, but maybe my body's going to feel a little bit better tomorrow around that. Um, and then the other piece there is colorful produce, which I'll, I'll get to in just a minute. Um, I think, though, that as we're thinking about supporting our organs of elimination, um, we want to think about how can I do that on a day-to-day -day basis? And then as the spring season comes around, do I want to eat any differently than I do the rest of the year? And I think that we don't need to. We can eat the same way we do the rest of the year, and our body's going to be fine. Our body's going to be able to clean itself out. I've also noticed personally that when I tune into what foods are in season in a particular season, it seems to feel kind of good in my body in the winter um, as we're going into the cold season. I do crave more starchy foods and heavier foods that are going to get me through that cold winter, and I do eat more of those foods. And oftentimes when I do that without guilt, with just, yeah, it's winter, it's a time for macaroni and cheese, um, then when spring comes around and there's fresh green and, and I'm outside playing in the grass with the bunnies, um, then I'm less attracted to those heavier foods and I'm more attracted to you know, eating the dandelions alongside the bunnies or whatnot. So tuning into that cycle with every season having something um, to offer and, and not a sense of, oh, I did something wrong. But no, it's just a transition into that spring season. Um, a couple of plants that I just wanted to call out for fun. Um, one is nettles. Who here has ever eaten nettles before? Good, much more than most crowds I would, I would see. Um, so nettles, if you haven't eaten them, have these little poison spikes on them that when you pick them, if you're not wearing gloves, they'll stab you and give you a terrible rash. Um, and for religious punishment in the past, people have whipped themselves with nettles. Um, so if you're wanting that spiritual punishment <laughs> satisfaction, you can start with a, a good whipping with nettles. Um, but then moving on from that, um, to eat the nettles, if we cook those nettles, those, those little spikes, De decompose and they're not a problem and we can actually eat nettles um, and they're very helpful um, they're very high in different minerals and vitamins like calcium and iron um, so they're a nutrient dense wild food um, not necessary but sometimes fun to go out and pick those nettles if they're growing near your house or buy them at the farmers market um, and so I included a recipe for a nettle pesto um, in the packet um, there has been some kind of equivocal research around you know, do eating nettles help with spring allergies, and that's, that's still kind of a question. Some people say they do. Um, but this is the kind of food that springtime comes you could add into your diet without making other changes and just feel like you were doing something springy. Uh, oops. Another option would be this colorful produce of spring. So food doesn't just have vitamins and minerals in it. It also has these what's called bioactive compounds or phytochemicals. It's the color compounds that give food the really bright colors and flavors, um, things you've probably heard of, like these flavonoids, anthocyanins, phenols. Um, but these colorful spring foods, um, just like colorful fall foods and colorful winter foods, are rich in these compounds. Um, and strawberries and rhubarb are two that are particularly rich in the spring season. And it seems like those compounds help the liver do its work a little bit faster, a little bit better. Um, it doesn't seem necessary. There's no research to suggest that you need to only eat a diet rich in colorful vegetables. Um, it's that balance, again, that's important. But adding a little bit more of these colorful things can help on a day-to-day -day basis um, in season with spring. And here's just a list um, of some of the things that are in season in the spring in our um, realm if you're wanting to eat, um, eat with the seasons. 
um, lots of greens and herbs and um, you know green things. It's, it's spring and the greens are, are coming up. Uh, and this is from Puget Sound Fresh if you're wanting to see what's available at your farmer's market. Um, and then edible flowers too. Um, there are quite a few flowers that are edible and the spring kind of going into early summer is a great time for flowers. Um, not for any particular nutritional reason. They're similar to vegetables and fruits. They do have nutrients in them, um, but just for the fun of feeling in rhythm with the season, um, something like sprinkling violets on your salads um, or rose petals can sometimes be nice um, to do. And then there's a recipe for a nettle pesto if you've never tried that before and you're wanting to have something springy. Um, there's some copies in the back. Um, so. All of that second part was all of those nutrition tips, some of which you've probably heard before around these are things you can do, you know, to improve your health overall, long term. Um, but the goal with that is not that those foods are the only foods that are the right foods. It's just that maybe some ideas of things to focus on a little bit more um, because each season does have new foods to try. and trying to find where that gray area of satisfaction is that we do have some nettles perhaps in our diet but we also have some other foods um, that are just for fun and for pleasure in our diet um, our liver will still be able to work our organs of elimination will still be able to work we'll still be able to cleanse um, and maybe instead of spending money on a detox powder, we can do something that's going to really be choosing health for the long term, like starting a garden bed um, with that money and perhaps having some spring greens. Um, and so looking for how can we, how can we move into that gray area of self-care um, a little bit more? How can we have both the nettles and the St. Patrick's Day cupcakes and hold them both in balance so that one is not good and one is not bad, but they're just both a part, a part of our life. I love this quote um, from Lao Tzu, who's a Taoist philosopher. When you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. When you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. So when you realize that you know what, maybe I'm okay as I am. Maybe my body is already working, already cleansing, and maybe food uh, is not going to save my soul. Maybe food is not going to gain me entry into heaven or immortality, but food is just food. Um, and I'm gonna eat some things that I enjoy, I'm gonna eat some things that are seasonal and fun, and I'm just gonna live and let live. Um, that can bring us a much greater and a much more sustaining happiness um, than any sort of short-term cleanse or diet often can. And so I'd like to just leave you with that idea today of can you find happiness in the gray area um, and, and where is that for you? So thank you very much. Um, As Dr. B mentioned, I, uh, I work in the Menu for a Change program, so if you have questions about that or um, anything else um, related to that, then you could talk to, um, talk to her afterwards. Um, does anyone have thoughts or questions? I could take just a couple minutes here. I know we're a few minutes over time, but if there's just a couple burning questions that people have about detoxing and cleansing. Yes? about detoxing. I'm just curious why people 65 or older don't eat as much water. Yeah, um, so our, the, the metabolism, when we metabolize um, everything, um, it, it creates heat and it uses water. It basically warms us up and dehydrates us a little bit. And so as we get older, our metabolic function just naturally slows down a little bit. So we don't need that extra fluid to kind of cool us off. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. What about gluten and inflammation? What about it? I don't know. I've just heard <laughs> that bread and gluten is bad because it causes inflammation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, if I started with this knowledge that certain people who are sensitive, who do have celiac disease, do see damage in their gut lining when they eat 
the, uh, when they eat gluten. And because of that damage, um, it's easier for food particles that maybe shouldn't get into the system because they're not broken down all the way to get into the bloodstream. And then that causes the immune system to go into overdrive and think there's something in the bloodstream that shouldn't be there, pump out more white blood cells, attack, attack, fight, fight. That's the process of inflammation. Um, so that does happen for some people when they eat gluten. But for people who don't have any kind of damage to their digestive tract when they eat gluten, there's no evidence that there's going to be inflammation because um, nothing is leaking out into the bloodstream, nothing is causing the immune system to go under the attack. Um, a lot of people, when they take gluten out of their diet, actually completely change their diet and start making homemade food and eating vegetables when they weren't eating vegetables anymore and um, you know all kinds of different changes, not just the gluten. And that's often why people feel better, not so much <laughs> the gluten. So, so yeah, it's very basic and mm -hmm. the healthy, balanced information. Yeah, but boring, <laughs> not sexy. It doesn't sound great. <laughs> yeah. Um, other, yeah, question in the back. So what you were mentioning, um, maybe known as leaky gut. Mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And um, is that very prevalent or is there just a small segment of I think so there's, so there's the leaky gut there's the leaky gut that could be caused by celiac disease, which is uh, an extreme level of leakiness. And then there's this theory that, okay, some people also experience leakage um, who don't have damage because um, their, their gut cells are spreading apart too much and so things are leaking through. Um, and so that, that piece seems to be hard to test for, hard to really know what, what the prevalence is in the population, but time and again it seems to be overblown to where it's assumed that so many more people actually experience this than, than really do, like the gluten thing. So I would be, I would be suspicious of leaky gut as the, the underlying answer for everything. Do you see self-referring patients? Uh does insurance reimburse for your services? Um, insurance usually reimburses for my services, not always, um, but a lot of insurances do. Yeah, you could call, check with the Menu for Change program about the options for that for you. Well, I want to say thank you again. This is, I think we all learned some things actually and kind of are thinking differently about some things related to the cleanse. So um, please have a great evening. If you want to stick around for a few extra questions individually, please do so. But thank you for coming.